Do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda this evening? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. Okay. Uh, we'll move on now to item three, which is presentations. And we will start with a mayor's proclamation honoring July 2024 as Parks and Recreation Month. So I want to read a bit from the proclamation, uh, noting that parks are an integral part of the community by enriching our connections with nature and with one another. Parks and Recreation foster social cohesiveness in communities. Parks and Recreation supports human development and endless learning opportunities that foster social, intellectual, physical, and emotional growth in people of all ages and abilities. Parks and Recreation strengthens community identity by providing facilities and services that reflect and celebrate community character, heritage, culture, history, aesthetics, and landscape. Parks and Recreation supports safe, vibrant, attractive, progressive communities that make life better through positive alternatives offered in their recreational opportunities. The California Parks and Recreation Society has released a statewide public awareness campaign, Park and Recreation Month 2024, Where You Belong, to inform citizens of the many benefits of utilizing parks, facilities, programs, and services. So I would like to now welcome Nikki, who leads our Parks and Recreation, uh, to, to speak a little more and to receive this proclamation. Thank you. Um, so again, yes, thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Um, as stated in the proclamation, this is a statewide statewide um, initiative organized by the California Parks and Recs um, Society. Within this county, we actually do um, something very interesting that not a lot of the counties do. Um, what you see here on the slides is a coordinated effort amongst um, all of our participating agencies um, for a collective ad. And you can, through this ad, which is currently running in the Good Times, you can find every single agency um, that is participating and you can follow the QR codes to learn more about what they are specifically doing for July is. Next slide, please. Um, but here in Capitola, we have highlighted um, some very special events to celebrate um, Parks and Rec Month. We are doing... Are the So the whole county's initiative is Family Fun Day. Um, Santa Cruz is hosting um, this year. It rotates to different agencies. Capitola helps by putting the ad. So that's our contribution. We have our Family Wharf Swim coming up. We also have a Parents' Night Out coming up in July. Um, there is a Junior Guard alum competition that you can look forward to. We have our July Food Truck Friday, as well as an additional food truck event that is at Jade Street Park on the 18th, and there will be field games as well. So we would like to encourage every member of the public to find a moment to appreciate um, something within their parks in July and celebrate this. And thank you very much for the proclamation. There's one more interesting thing that's happening um, in July that is related to us, and that is that we... Um, uh, per council approval this evening um, have identified that we're going to be relocating to uh, Opal Cliffs. Uh, there's a couple of empty school rooms. And so when we go through the remodel, um, we're going to take up resident right next door. And so we're really excited to be able to still be in our park um, and provide programs from that space. So thank you very much. And I'm available to ask, answer any questions if you have. Thank you, Nikki. And thank you for all that you do for us in our, in our parks and our recreation and everything that you've done. Uh, it's, it's truly wonderful here in the city. Thank you. Any further comments or questions from council members? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just would like to express my thanks as well. And I think you've developed a lot, even just in the few years that I've been involved. And um, I'm really proud of the programs that we have. And we just had two days of the, the junior guard comps out there. And that was really fun to see. And so just good job and thank you. Um, so, Nikki, we get to see all of your team in action with the summer care program and junior guards and all of these events, and it's just such a special thing for our community to offer, um, just not to our local kiddos, but to the county. So thank you for doing such a tremendous job, and congratulations to a, a great team. And to follow up, super proud of our parks. Thanks for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. 
We'll move on now to item four, report on closed session. Good evening, council members and community. A closed session was had on the items on the agenda and no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Uh, additional materials? We received additional materials for tonight's meeting for item 9A, five applications for the Finance Advisory Committee were received after publication of the agenda. Um, in addition, there was one email received. All additional materials have been provided to staff for that item. For item 9B, two emails were received relating to that item and both were provided to the City Council in advance of tonight's meeting. In addition, all of the presentations for tonight's presentation items were uploaded to our agenda packet and are available for public review prior to tonight's meeting. Thank you. We're gonna go now to item six, oral communi communications by members of the public. This is an opportunity for the public to address the council on any items that are not on tonight's agenda. You will have three minutes to speak. Please uh, state your name if you'd like it recorded in the minutes. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Goran Klapic. I'm an army veteran. In Swiss German, that means army veteran. I play almost every day uh, basketball at J3 Park. Uh, I want to commemorate something. Uh, I lost a good friend of mine. His name, uh, name was uh, Damon Gutzwiller. <laughs> he was gunned down by some uh, fucking junkies. who were drug users. Goran, we welcome your comments. I ask you to keep it uh, And uh, I just want to commemorate that. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you all. Thank you. Additional public comment. Hi, welcome. Hi. <clears throat> Marilyn Garrett, you know, when you go to a mechanic or some business, you want to check if they are safe, effective, uh, and do work that you consider reliable. Um, with pharmaceutical drugs, you also want to check out uh, track records. I have a book by a local author, the second edition just came out. It's called The Unfortunate Truth About Vaccines, Exposing the Vaccine Orthodoxy by Leon Canarot. There's a section here, Pharmaceutical Settlements, compiled by violationtracker.goodjobsfirst.org. Top 10 drug companies below are the criminal penalties paid out between 2000 and 2022. Um, and drug companies listed Johnson and Johnson, monetary penalty 15 billion plus, and the number of criminal fines 74. Merck. 10 billion, about 10 and a half billion number of criminal fines, 81. Pfizer, monetary penalty, 10 billion, 268 million, et cetera. Number of criminal fines, 90. These are the same corporations that produce the COVID shots. Another section here in the book, COVID-19 hysteria is the title. It opens with a quote. A lie doesn't become truth. Wrong doesn't become right. And evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by a majority. Booker T. Washington. The introduction, the recent hysteria, this book is available through Amazon. The recent hysteria created in the media regarding SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is an, yet another example of the manufactured hysteria that was covered in part seven. In the groundbreaking book, Virus Mania, the authors noted that the scientists have been unable to isolate isolate viruses from other nanoparticles observed under electronic magnification. They contend that all of these assumed viruses have never been properly isolated. This is well worth reading for Thank the you for health your comments. and we appreciate it. of everyone. The unfortunate truth about vaccines. Thank you.
Any further public comments this evening? Seeing none, we will go now to staff and city council comments, and I'll start with staff. Are there any comments this evening? I think there's just one, two comments I wanted to offer. The first one is, is on our consent items this evening, we have an agreement to um, lease some space from the school district for a temporary home for our recreation program up at Jade Street Park. Uh, initially, I will share with the council that that was intended to be an in-kind contribution from the school district to support the development of the Treasure Cove Community uh, Park. Unfortunately, their lawyers ended up having some concerns about making an in-kind donation, so instead they're leasing it to us for a dollar a month. So I just wanted the council to be aware of that and the community to be aware of the partnership with the school district around trying to get um, Treasure Cove and the community center project done. Secondarily, this is going to be really quick. This is just a public service announcement for everyone. I have noticed that in communications outside the city and internal to the city, a lot of emails have been getting caught in our spam filters. This is both on city accounts and personal accounts. I think that everyone just needs to remember that in this new age of AI, there's all kinds of new software being used out there. And so if you have an important email, always follow it up with a phone call. Just a piece of advice. Really noted. Yes. I, I have an announcement tonight, and I usually don't, and that is that two days ago, the Supreme Court struck down the CBRT ballot measure that was making its way to the November ballot, which would have radically reworked municipal finance and really wreaked havoc for uh, cities throughout the state. And the Supreme Court struck it down on procedural grounds, finding that it is a constitutional revision rather than a constitutional amendment and is not appropriate for the initiative process. So. Um, that was a, a, a great moment for people who were interested in the stability of cities. Great, thank you. Further staff comments? None? Okay, we'll go to City Council. Any comments this evening? Yeah, I'd just like to um, share with our community that there are a number of um, programs offered by Central Coast Community Power. This is where we get our energy from. So if you have a... Um, a car or a home that you would like to get plugged into. They're offering a significant um, rebate program. Um, they are no longer offering the e-bikes um, rebate program because it's shifted to where you can purchase a bike um, at the store and get the rebate directly from that bike store. So 3CE, Central Coast Community Energy, lots of great um, opportunity for refunds in electrifying your I'm home or looking for rebate programs. Thank you. Thank you. Council comments? Council Member Clark? Yeah, I'd like to uh, thank professional surfer Sean Burns for being here tonight. Um, he was instrumental in helping with uh, Save the Wave Coalition and uh, you know, going to introduce the World Surfing Reserve to Capitola. So it's pretty exciting. So thanks for being here and thanks for all the work you did with him. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick uh, request for a future agenda item. Um, a good friend of mine is a councilwoman in the city of Sunnyvale expecting a child soon. And an experience that she had in her city brought to my attention that there are virtually um, no parental leave protections for elected officials. And so at this time, um, based on state law, and I'll ask our city attorney to correct me, um, if I'm if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is at this time, if a elected official needs to take family leave um, of more than 60 days, they need to get permission from the council that they're on. And if not, then their seat, seat is automatically vacated after 60 days. My concern with that is that um, anyone who may join this council in the future that needs to take family leave is at the mercy of their fellow council members on whether or not they can take family leave and, and remain in their seat. And so I would like a future agenda item um, that council members uh, requesting up to 12 weeks of parental leave will automatically receive it upon notification of the need for it to the city manager and the mayor. Great, thank you. All right, uh, that is it from me. So I will move on now to our consent agenda. Are there any questions on our consent agenda? Would anyone like to remove any items for further consideration? Seeing none, we'll entertain a motion. 
I'll move the consent agenda items A through F. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. We can still do roll call, even though Alexander's absent, right? Because we have no one joining. Okay. Um, so, or excuse me, not roll call. Um, voice, vote. voice vote. Yes. Um, okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. That brings us to item 9A, City Council appointments to advisory bodies. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Sharing my screen here. Before you tonight, we have a City Council appointment to the City's Finance Advisory Committee. The Finance Advisory Committee, or the FAC as it's known locally, is composed of seven members, the mayor and vice mayor, three Capitola residents, and two Capitola business persons. On May 9th, the City Council approved an amendment to the bylaws to allow for appointment of non-business representatives if there were no applications on file. Currently, we have a vacancy for two business representative terms. However, the bylaws state that the Council can appoint one or two members um, to the business representative positions. And these terms end on December 31st, 2024. As stated during the additional materials portion of the agenda, we did receive additional applications after publication of the agenda packet. The names of the applicants as they currently stand are on the screen before you. We have two regular resident applicants and four business representative applicants. And these are listed in the order in which they were received by the city clerk's office. The recommended action for the city council this evening is to appoint um, one or two members of the public to the FAC for term ending on December 31st, 2024. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Any questions from council? No? No? Okay. Uh, with no questions, we will go ahead and go to public comment. If anyone has public comment on this item, please uh, approach the uh, podium. You'll have up to three minutes, and please state your name if you would like it recorded accurately in the minutes. Hi, welcome. BIA Chair Mijos Takaria. I just want to get a clarification on the um, applications. Now that there's four applicants that are business representatives, will those two of those spots be filled? And then how do you guys go about choosing the four applicants? And then um, based on the advisory council meeting with staff and learning more about the Measure F funds and sales tax revenue, I feel it's important that business representatives get onto this um, finance advisory committee because the sales tax definitely affects us. But as a proponent for the business climate, we want to make sure that we can see how this goes forward and to support our community so that we can get the budget back on track. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. My name is Keith Gahalen. I think you should adjourn your, um, your usual procedural event because I think the council should um, make the decision on whether they're only going to fill the two business positions now that they have four candidates before they ask for public discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment on this item? I'm Welcome. Matt Arthur, uh, business owner in the village. I just want to clarify, I think I heard we're here to fill two business spots when you just said just fill two vacancies. So I want to just clarify that it is two business um, vacancies that you guys will be filling. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Further public comment on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back. Do you want to address some of the, the questions brought up during public comment? So the change to the bylaws to the fact state that the city council can appoint a regular re resident of the city if there are no business applicants on file. So with the addition of the business applicants on file, that does change the, the current status of the vacancy. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, we will bring it back to council. Um, started this in, council member clerk. That's great that we got the turnout for all the applicants. Exciting to see four business members on there. Um, and they all seem to be really qualified. At this point, I would suggest we just pick the first two that applied, because all four seem equally qualified and. Uh, you know, would, would do well. That was my input. Thank you. Um, can you pull the slide back up so we can see those? Council member, do you have any comments? Just one more. Yeah, I'm really glad that 
more um, people associated with businesses did apply for this. Um, and if um, I'm fine with doing that, I, I wouldn't mind seeing Wesley Nielsen on the fact personally. Okay. Vice Mayor Brooks? No, um, I'd be happy to make a motion to appoint Anthony and Matt Arthur as our two finance advisory committee um, members. And just, um, just for clarification, there's only one more meeting at the end for this year, and then applications need to come back. So it's just process. So you just have to reapply. But is that accurate? Correct. The terms expire December 31st. My office will reach out to all of the current board and commission members advising them that their terms are expiring. They'll need to reapply. It's a two-year term. Um, applicants who are not applied right now, their applications remain on file for one year and they'll automatically be brought forward for consideration at the end of the year when we redo all the applicants. Great. So my motion stands. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Great. Yes. I'm glad to see that we got applicants. I know we were um, recruiting for almost a year and so it's exciting to see that we had some people step up and want to take, you know, these, these um, roles. Uh, I want to remind everyone else who applied that these meetings are open to the public. You're welcome to come to any of the meetings and provide input um, as, you, as you see fit. So with that, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. All right. Anthony and Matt, we look forward to seeing you at the PAC meetings. All right. We are moving on to item 9B, uh, 2024 general municipal election. Hello again, Hello again, Mayor and City Council. So tonight for you this evening is consideration of two resolutions related to the November 24 general election. And so we're going to split up the presentation into two sections, the resolution outlining all the general election requirements and kind of the official direction to place the seats for City Council on the ballot. And then we'll split up the second part of the the presentation for the ballot measure resolution afterwards. So it would be two separate motions. So just as a refresher, the election requirements for the city of Capitola are outlined in our municipal code and they're also in California elections code. For the November 5th, 2024 ballot, there will be two city council seats for four year terms each. Um, we have two incumbents eligible, or not eligible, but we have two incumbents for these positions. One of them is not eligible for the seat because she will be termed out. So there will be one eligible incumbent for this election. The resolution before you this evening officially calls the election and consolidates the election with the county as has been done previously in the city of Capitola. And it requests the county to conduct the election. In terms of how to run for local office, the city clerk will work with candidates for the city council. Information about how to run has been provided on our city website. We have a pamphlet which was included in the agenda packet and we hosted a candidate information night last week in person. The nomination period for city council begins July 15th and ends on August 9th unless an eligible incumbent does not pull nomination papers in which case the, el the, el the nomination period is extended. So with that, the first recommended action for you this evening is to adopt a resolution ordering the 2024 general municipal election, requesting that the county conduct the election and consolidate the election with the general election being held on Tuesday, November 5th, 2024. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Um, so just a procedural uh, question here. Since this is two motions, should I do two different public comment opportunities or should we get all the information, go to public comment and then come back for the two motions? Or does it matter? I, I would do it separately. Two different public I, it, comments? It doesn't matter, whatever the mayor prefers. Um, but if you, you need to take public comment before you take action. Yeah. So if you plan to, and I'll look at, I'm looking at the clerk here too, I would expect that it makes more sense to adopt, to take action on number one before moving on to number two. Okay. Then right. I do public comment twice. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so no questions on this aspect of this agenda item. So in that case, we are going to take it out to public comment on this particular aspect of this particular agenda item. Just, just the resolution to call for an election. Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to council and uh, further discussion or a motion on the recommended action? The first recommended action. I can move the first recommended action of this item. I would like to second it. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 
Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Move on to part B. Thanks so much. Let me just share my screen again with you guys. So thank you for that. Now we get to move on to our proposed local sales tax measure. So I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation off, and then I'm going to hand it over to our city manager to help explain some more of the background. For some basic background about the sales tax measure, in November of 2023, the city council authorized an agreement with EMC Research to conduct polling on potential revenue measures within the city and with the voters. In March 2024, EMC Research returned to the City Council and presented polling results and identified the following voter priorities. Public safety response, maintenance of roads, sidewalks, and bike lanes, maintaining the beach and the new wharf, and recreation programming for youth and supporting local businesses. EMC Research identified that voter support for renewal of the existing Measure F quarter cent tax measure is above the threshold required for approval. There are other ballot measures known to us that are going to be on the November 5th ballot. There is a regional clean water and wildfire protection measure going forward. It's, I think, also known by open space measure or open something, open space. It's going to be a parcel tax, and it's a flat rate of $87 per year per parcel, and it is until ended by voters. Central Fire District has a general obligation bond on the ballot. It's going to be a bond measure of $31 per $100,000 dollars of assessed value. I believe there's a typo in the $100,000 there, but it's $100,000 to be clear, and it's going to be a 30-year duration. And then SoCal Unified Elementary School District also has a bond measure on the ballot, and it will be $30 per $100,000 for 30 years. And so those are the known factors going on to the ballot on November 5th. And at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to City Manager Goldstein to kind of explain some more of the background. All right. Thank you, Julia. So there's a number of factors that we've taken into account as we've considered why we might think about a sales tax measure. Um, one is, is the projected fiscal challenges. When we look ahead into this future for the next 10 years for the city, we can see some really obvious challenges, both associated with the expiration of Measure F in 2027, as well as some other known increases that we face. In addition, um, Sales tax is a really interesting tax in that there's a balance between what the residents pay, which is less than a third of the overall sales tax in Capitola, and visitors. Um, and there's no other tax that's sort of shared that way. It's either paid 100% by residents, in the kind, like as a property tax or a parcel tax, or 100% by visitors, like a TOT would be. Um, and in the past, the city has received really great support from the community for prior sales tax measures. So those are some of the reasons why we're looking at a sales tax. Next slide, please. Looking at our 10-year projection that I mentioned earlier, you know, when we take a look out into the future, we can see around 2027 with the expiration of Measure F, as well as the increased pension costs, that we're ending up with about a $2 million gap as we look out ahead into the future. Next slide, please. There's a number of reasons why the city is in this position. Um, this is one of the key drivers I think everyone should understand, that if you go back and you compare sort of to a benchmark year of 2006 and you imagine what sales tax would be today if it had grown at the same rate as inflation, the city would have about $2.3 million more in sales tax revenue. So that has been steadily eroding essentially the purchasing power from our sales tax over time. Whereas if we were an all property tax district, which, you know, I don't need to give examples, but there's other examples of agencies around the state, around the county that received all of the revenue from property tax. That has conversely exceeded the rate of inflation over time. So they've sort of had more purchasing power over the last 10, 15 years. Next slide, please. Another key thing I think for everybody to keep in mind, and I know the council is well aware, is that the city only gets seven and a half percent of the property taxes that are paid in the city. You know, I know people when they they buy a house million dollar home, you know, they're paying $10,000 a year, $12,000 a year in property tax. Of that amount, the city is getting 750 bucks. You know, it really helps, I think, put it in perspective for people. In addition, the sales tax that's paid, the city gets 16% of it. That's, you know, so when you pay a sales tax bill, if it's a dollar, the city's getting 16 cents since that sales tax. And we get none of the income tax. So a number of years ago, the finance director and I went through an exercise because I know everybody feels at times like, you know, they pay so much in taxes. 
how much of that does the city of Capitola get? So we went through and we estimated what was the total property tax in Capitola, what was the total sales tax paid in the city, what was the total income tax paid in the city, and we ended up with a figure of about $180 million. Um, and of that amount, the city of Capitola receives $13.4 million, or 7.4%. So to put it in perspective, I think it's helpful for everybody to think about that, that you know, when you think about your taxes are going towards your roads, or your taxes are going to pay for our police officers, or your taxes are going for you know, whatever it is that you're looking the city to do, you have to understand that very little of your taxes are actually going towards those uses. And this is a way with the sales tax to actually increase that amount. Next slide, please. I mentioned it earlier, but this sort of shows where every penny of your sales or your property tax dollar goes. The county gets 24% of it. The city of Capitola gets 7.4. Central Fire gets a little over 15%. And then the schools pass through the state at just under 50%. Next slide, please. In addition, when we look around, you know, sales tax, obviously people have a choice about where they shop, whether they're going to shop in Capitol or they're going to shop in the county. And when they take a look at what that overall market looks like starting next week, these are the sales tax rates in the other jurisdictions. All the other cities are at nine and a qu three quarters. The unincorporated county, I think there may be a lawsuit around their tax increase is pen pending, but they're slated to go to nine and a half percent and Capitola would be at nine percent as of July 1. So we're between a half to three quarters of a percent lower than any of the other jurisdictions in the county. Next slide, please. We're also taking a look at whether or not thinking about ending Measure F early. And you know the reason why I think we can talk about that is, is because we got what we said we would do with Measure F done. You know, we've rebuilt the flume, we've rebuilt the jetty, we've um, rebuilt the wharf, and we've put funding into public safety. So we have a breakdown of where the funding for Measure F since it's been received, is gone. The vast majority, 61%, has gone towards the wharf. That's about $3.6 million. That, those funds leveraged, I think, close to $5 million, $6 million of outside city money. Um, so, you know, the city was really effective in getting money and then leveraging it to do the wharf and get it done early. Next slide, please. Um, so that's what I just said about <laughs> because we got things early, talking about replacing Measure F, which is a quarter cent tax with a new half cent measure, and that would generate an estimated $2.2 million a year. Um, looking ahead, you know, those, those financial drivers that you saw in the long-term projection didn't include specific projects, but there are a number of specific projects that I think the city may be contemplating in future years. Um, Number one, you're going to hear more about it later this evening, is a $10-plus million effort to stabilize Cliff Drive. Cliff Drive is an important arterial, alter, <clears throat> excuse me, arterial road to get in and out of the village. It's also got all kinds of public infrastructure inside it. And we have the opportunity to stabilize that, sort of a once-in-a-generation opportunity, but we're going to have to come up with around a million dollars of local funding to get that done. In addition, council will recall that we're doing the Bay Avenue corridor study, and I would anticipate that some elements of the corridor study would be components in future budgets as well. And then I know for everybody, pavement management is always a challenge, and so that's something that we're going to have to look at funding in future years as well. Next slide. Um, a question came up at a community meeting, we informational community meeting we held about this, about how, how these funds could be overseen. Um, we talked a little bit about the annual audit that's conducted by the city's independent auditors. These are people that don't work for staff. They work for the city council, and they, um, they are reviewing every action, financial action the city takes. In addition, um, this is revenue that would be reviewed annually, annually by the FAC. You know, we've often developed kind of special reports for the Finance Advisory Committee to see specifically where Measure F uh, or before that Measure O funding is going, and that's certainly something we could do. Uh, and then, obviously, the city council will review revenue every year in its budget. Next slide, please. So this is the proposed ballot language. This is the same language that you saw, I want to say, four or six weeks ago, last time we talked about it. Um, I'm not going to, we're going to want to make sure that we have the right language here, so we may want to spend some time on it, but we'll get all the way through the presentation, and then I'll let the council kind of guide the conversation. But this is the language that we had seen last time. 
and it reflects the priorities. I guess I should also say this was drafted with the assistance of EMC Research as well as the City Attorney's Office and reflects a lot of the priorities that were identified through the polling as well as kind of known needs in the city. And so next slide. This is the recommended action. And rather than try and read it, we're going to go to one more slide <laughs> that breaks up the recommended action into six different components. And we can go back to it. The first one is, is number one, is to submit the ballot measure, the capital of voters to increase the sales tax. And we want to take a look and make sure we're comfortable with the language. Two, to consolidate that measure with the general election. Three, to pay, pay the county our share of that election to direct the city attorney to prepare an impartial analysis of the measure, um, to appoint two city council measure members to a subcommittee to prepare an argument um, to submit in favor of the measure. And then the last potential item would be to allow community members to file a potential rebuttal should an argument be filed against the measure. So we can go back to the actual action, but I wanted to break it into those chunks because I think it's a little bit easier to sort of get them out than understand them than it is to tease it out of that paragraph there. And with that, I'm available for questions. Great, thank you. Questions from Council? Councilmember Clark? Councilmember Morgan? Vice Mayor Brooks? Okay, no questions yet. Uh, so we'll go ahead and bring this to public comment and um, bring it back to Council after that for further questions, comments, deliberation. If there's any members of the public that have comment on this item, now would be the time. You'll have three minutes. Please state your name for the record if you'd like it included in the minutes for tonight's meeting. Saying none, we'll bring it back to the council. Can you put the slide back up that had the component parts of the recommended action? I, I will note that they're all sort of one piece of a resolution. So if we want to take some component out, we can modify the resolution. All right, so one of the things that I would like um, staff to look into, one of the things I'd like for staff to look into, um, should we move forward with the language uh, that's, that was provided about the ballot, what would be on the ballot, and after a subcommittee um, looks at the argument, I think that subcommittee, it would be nice for the subcommittee to also consider um, some of the projects that we might commit a portion of this funding to. And then if staff could look into the feasibility of creating something like a resolution of intent that the council could later consider um, as kind of a means of um, accountability in the future. Is that something that, that staff could research the feasibility of a resolution of intent of how this money will be spent. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, with that, um, part of this is also to appoint two city council members to a subcommittee to submit an argument supporting the measure. Uh, anyone interested? I would like to help with that. Okay. Or Ms. Um, I'd be happy to, um, if, if, is that a, yeah? yeah? I'd be happy to if Council Member Clark joins me. That would be great. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, so we have a subcommittee um, of Vice Mayor Brooks, Council Member Clark. Do we need any further direction other than what I have requested in, regarding the study of feasibility? We've determined two council members to be on the subcommittee. What am I missing? Do you want to take a look at the language and make sure everyone's on board with the ballot language? Yes, please. Bounce back a couple slides. Mayor Brooks? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Kind of deep in yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was just reading it. Um, just for clarity, I just want to make sure, so you went through your presentation pretty quickly. Um, so just to confirm, your office, Samantha, looked at this language already. Is that accurate? We did, yes. And so this aligns with the outcomes from our survey, our community survey before they, they tee up correctly. Is that accurate? Yeah, EMC helped craft this language looking at the survey, looking at the city's needs. Um, 
It's always tricky. I mean, I, I would just share that as long as it leads clearly to us in the community, and this is something that Council Member Clark and I can just ensure that the clarity is there for our constituents to read when they receive the ballot. Um, you know, we know what this all means because we've been working on this, but we just want to make sure it reads clearly. Um, just for the community's sake, these are not restricted dollars. So these items are entered into general fund to um, to go, well, they would, general, they would go into general fund. These are not restricted dollars for anything specific or that one item is going to get more money than the other. And I, that's what Mayor Brown, you were alluding to of some sort of resolution just to hold us accountable to, um, to these items. So, um, but just for clarity for the community members. Um, my question though is, can you tell me a little bit how this item would pass? So there's two different types of vote, um, uh, ways that this could pass. Tell us what kind of measure this is and what, um, what do we need for it to get approved? Sure. So it's a 50% measure. So it needs 50% plus one vote in the next, in the November election to pass. Um, I think your point is exactly spot on about this being a general tax. And, you know, I think it's important for everybody to remember that our sort of business as usual status quo forecast shows this about $2 million get that gap in coming years. And you can see that the measure we project to generate around 2.2 million annually. So, you know, there's, I think it's worth noting that there isn't a ton of extra bandwidth in this to build, for example, a brand new wharf, something like that. You know, there's the opportunity to do some things. I think being clear is really important for everybody about what the expectations can be. Yeah, that's really helpful. It's to complete or to, to carry on as a city. Um, I've mentioned before, we're only 75 years old, right, um, of, a, of a young city. So this is really important for us to do this um, as stated. I'm, I'm actually comfortable with the language. I, again, it makes sense to me, but I'm looking at my peers here to see if it makes sense too. Yeah, I'd like to know if we could add um, the fact that we have the lowest local tax. Would that be appropriate in the measure for the ballot? I think that would be more appropriate in the argument in favor of the measure. I think we really have to echo what the city manager said, how we will still have the lowest tax rate. And I'll just add that that's what you and I can work on, Council Member Clark, in the argument. You know, we can pitch all day why it's important to our community here and to our police officers and our staff all day long. But in our argument that goes in the ballot, it'll um, we can state all of those facts to make it make this less complicated. Um, and so it goes on the ballot in November, and then if it passes, it goes into effect in January, and that's in January immediately measure F will be repealed. Is that accurate? Okay, and does that take any other steps or do we need to do anything else as a council? To no, um, there, it's an ordinance in your muni code and there are two ways to pass an ordinance. One is the way you mostly pass them, which is two readings. The other way is for the people to pass them via a vote. So no, nothing else is needed. Sometimes cities do some other step, but you're not required to. You'll certify the election. Yeah, I really appreciate what um, our city manager said with the difference of between like a property tax, right? Our constituents have to pay that versus a TOT tax, which is just for our visitors. When I look at an increase of sales tax, it's like everyone's carrying the burden, right? Our, our visitors, the city, everyone is holding hands to support Capitola. So I'm, um, I'm happy to, and I, are we comfortable, city attorney, to do this as one um, recommended action? Let me, ask, let me ask just a couple questions to see if we need to make any changes. So I think what I heard is um, there will be a subcommittee of uh, Vice Mayor Brooks and Council Member Clark to draft the ballot argument in favor of the measure. And so your names will be added by the clerk into Section 6D of the resolution. And then will the... Would the council like for the subcommittee to, the subcommittee will be drafting the argument on behalf of the council, not in your individual capacities. Would the council like for the subcommittee to draft the argument, give it to the clerk, and then it's done? Or does the council want to see the argument again? Do you? Yeah. Bring it back. 
Okay, so it'll come back. So that it gets on the ballot, it'll come back at the July, is it 25th meeting? Okay, very good. Then in that case, I suggest that we strike from the measure section six, in, in section 6D, the last line of that section reads, once the argument is lodged with the city clerk, the city clerk shall notify other members of the council who may then sign the argument on file but may not make any revisions thereto. I suggest we strike that line because it's unnecessary because the argument will be coming back to the council. Okay? I further suggest that the council strike the final paragraph in section six, which regards rebuttals which the council can discuss at the July 25th meeting as well. So section 6E. Okay. I'll move forward with um, the staff recommended, recommended action with the city attorney's amendments. Thank you. We have a motion, do we have a second? I'll second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. And just for the sake of discussion, just because I want to clarify, the can you go back to the slide with the three, or maybe you can just tell me, the three projects that you were recommending that this funding could be used for was Cliff Drive, Resilience, Road Maintenance. What was the third one? Yeah. Bay Avenue Corridor. So, okay, I was just making sure that the, the things we're considering this funding go to is um, included in the ballot language, and it is. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? Uh, did that include public safety? Yes, public safety is the, the first first line to protect essential city services, including public safety and emergency services. And I think that's Perfect. Thank a you. really point, important point that you make. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We are going to move on to item 9C, the Doublelicious Car Show. Who do we have presenting on? Oh, it's Captain okay. Ryan's. Oh, that's okay. Out. Take it. I didn't. Somebody came with Ryan. All good. <laughs> those stickers. Absolutely. Priorities. I agree. All right. Good evening, Mayor Brown, Council. Thank you. So tonight we are here to talk about Vida Delicious, major event. As the administrative captain, it's my role to bring, to, to act as a conduit for folks who want to have a major event to bring them forward to council. So just a little background, thank you. Um, in March of this year, we city council adopted an ordinance amending the special events application and approval process. And in March, we also um, received an application from the V Doublelicious Car Club for a special event in the village to be held on August 10th. Um, this event qualifies per our ordinance as being a major event because it reaches the threshold of being more than 200 people in attendance and because of the impacts to city services. The overall event, the request is that the village would be closed from approximately 6 a.m. to about 5 p.m. The following streets, that would include Stockton Avenue, Monterey, San Jose, um, all the way to, Cap to Capitol Avenue. They're also requesting the use of the bandstand for amplified sound and for music and, our, and event announcements. And then some obvious impacts to the city, the police staffing, um, public works with the increase of um, attendance in the village, loss of parking revenue, for the village and of course impacts to parking for village residents and employees. We've learned in the past, um, our organizers are here tonight. The gentlemen are here to answer any further questions, but they also attended the Capitol Car Show this year and got to see that there's, there's we learned through running that event that some things that go into that is posting no parking signs in the village. That needs to happen 72 hours in advance. 
um, so that we can lawfully tow vehicles when it comes to the event time. This is roughly the hourly rate for a parking enforcement officer. We did discuss that with the event organizers, what that would cost um, for our staff. Next slide. We've also found through our experience that um, in order to support an event from a public safety standpoint, it is helpful to have a team that can assist the event outside of your regular patrol staff. And so this is roughly, we would create a, a team for the event to support it. The, it doesn't necessarily mean that those would be the number of hours that they would work. Um, it would really depend on the setup and breakdown of the event and what the event brings to the village and how we need to support that. Just to recap, um, we have nine major special events that happen on a regular basis in the city, of, in the village, and in the city. And we have 26 minor events, special events that take place on a regular basis also within the city. And so in the end, my ask today is really I'm simply a conduit to make sure that their voice is heard. They're, they're making an ask to have this event. Um, as, as stated in the staff agenda report, they support local nonprofits. They're here to answer any further questions if you have of them. They did this event in the city of Santa Cruz on the Santa Cruz Wharf, and apparently it, was, it worked out well. Um, and so that is their ask coming forward to you all tonight is if they would be able to do this event on August 10th this year. Thank you. Uh, council questions? Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so where we, I love events. I can't speak for the rest of, but I love events. I think it, it's great to have as many as absolutely possible um, for the city of Capitol. And I noticed the um, report didn't have any um, Recommend, recommendation from your team. There's a lot of events going on, um, and at the end of the day, I'd love to know whether your team and staff have the bandwidth, essentially, to take this on. We can say yes to amazing events every day. Um, I think it's great for the community. I think it's great for our businesses. Um, it brings people in, but really, I, I need to know from the experts here who put it together and um, whether it's something that you can actually do. Supporting it from a public safety standpoint, we our officers are will sign up to work the event um, for an overtime rate. So, in, in from that perspective, yes, um, I I did open that up to um, our department to see what the overall consensus was. So, yes, um, they they would be willing to support it from that that standpoint. We haven't gotten in the weeds as to the planning and preparation. That's that would be the the club's um, role that we wouldn't be putting on the event, just supporting it from the public safety standpoint. Yeah, a little bit of it is that we plan for these, we approve the list, you know, prior to the year starting. And so it's kind of hard to keep letting additional um, groups come in. And so, but I'm hearing you say you really haven't talked about that or if there is really any I think I asked the same, I posed the same question the last time, was that too many when, in terms of what we agreed upon? And so, um, although this is a, sounds like a fun event, um, but it sounds like you really haven't had the chance to discuss this with the whole team yet. Correct. Okay. Um, and then is there a reason, and this might be for the folks bringing this forward, um, why it's not going to just stay in Santa Cruz? I'm just curious. Other than Capitola being amazing. Yeah. Can you please can I house, yeah, speak into the microphone? <laughs> this is OJ. Hello, my name is OJ Macias. Thank you. Um, we are holding the event also in Santa Cruz in October. So we also want to take this venue also. The Wharf and Capitol are, are two great venues. Okay. So that's what we'd like to do. Great. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Questions? Council Member Clark? Yeah, since we, oh, he was up at the podium. You might want to come back and ask some questions. Uh, our car show that we do is, is very successful, and, and the reason why it is, is is the volunteers. We have a big operational plan that we worked on for like a year. What I would have, like to ask 
is that the police department or even us work with the organizers to make sure they have as many volunteers that we have and that it runs as smoothly. There are several things from the beginning to the end that has to be done. I don't want to just approve a plan without having seen that operational plan of how we do everything from the beginning to the end. Yes, we would love to work with whoever is willing to help us out with this event to uh, volunteer. We have plenty of volunteers within our group, family members, friends, that we will help with putting the cars in place and stuff like that, making sure everything is running smoothly. We, we have quite a few people on board. So, Captain Ryan, was, is there somebody that, that could be available to work with them um, to make sure we get all that done? I don't know if it could be somebody from the foundation or from the police department just to see that it, to follow through with it to make sure it's done? From an operational uh, perspective, I would, um, it would be myself and the operations captain, Kilroy, to make sure that the, the, it was a sound plan for moving cars in and out of the village and shutting down the village with bollards for the day. Yeah, we have a great operational plan. I just want to, again, make sure that we follow it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have one, um, one last question. When, because our year is different from like a school year, from a fiscal year, remind me when we open up applications again and when we approve, I think this is more a Julia question. Um, no, who would, when do we approve somebody? Anybody? So I, I don't remember exactly. I gave a presentation to you to the to council um, wrapping up our events. Yeah. However, um, I haven't seen anything that prohibits people from coming in at any point and saying, "Can we have an event?" I, I've had that question asked several times leading up to this, and the door doesn't close per se for people to ask. They get to they get to ask, and right now the police department stands as the conduit to bring folks like OJ in front of you to say, can we ask this question? I see, thank you for the clarification. I was under the assumption that we pre-approve X amount of events throughout the year, but you're, you're spot on. So that, that clarifies it, thank you. Additional questions? Um, I'm not sure I'm seeing, so I see this is gonna require 200 parking spaces and forgive me that I don't recall do we charge as a city for each parking space for the loss of parking revenue or? We have not. I don't, I don't see that in here. No, we don't have a standing um, precedent set that we charge any of the organizations that come in and shut down the village that we charge them for parking revenue. Okay, thank you for that. Um, okay, I think that's it for questions for me. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll go now to public comment on this item. If there are any members of the public that have a comment on this item, now would be the time. Eloise Ruth Sabarski. Hi, welcome. And I am Lance Sabarski. Um, I'm uh, one of the lead surf coaches for Veteran Surf Alliance. You guys are very kind to us here in this town. Um, we are a big supporter of the VW Club. They their wharf event raised uh, enough money for us too. They donated it to us. We're a nonprofit here. I'm sure you guys have heard about us. Um, not only is a VW show, I mean, what VW, VWs are the beach, right? It would be great to have a big VW show. The, you know, the micro buses and the VWs with surfboards on them. It says all beach about it. And it's a, these guys are a group of great guys. I've been to their events before. Um, not only having the show here, but it's a big, um, financial boost to the economy here in the town too. all the restaurants and stuff that'll make money, um, you know, the apparel places and stuff like that. And not only do people come to the shows, they also come here to shop. So um, I think it would be a great big revenue um, raiser for the city of Capitola also. Um, and these VW crew is a very good crew, like I've said. And uh, I think that it's a great thing you guys should think about. Um, Veteran Surf Alliance, we've got a pretty big um, group of us now. A bunch of us will be volunteering to help this event and be setting up a booth out there to try to um, get more veterans um, into the water and surfing with uh, PTSD and war trauma. We try to get these guys the help they need um, through the ocean and ocean therapy. So um, I think it's a great thing. I think Capitola should move forward with this. And uh, it's it, the operation on the wharf, like I said, went very well. Um, so. I don't know if you guys can talk to the people, um, the police or whatever, to help organize that and get their opinion on it. But it was a very smooth operation. It was a money raiser for us. 
And uh, OJ is a good dude. And uh, let's try to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Say hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, welcome. All four events. Um, I don't agree with council member books that as many events as possible. I'm curious to find out if this is going to be a net loss for the city, where it's going to, you know, how it's going to offset. It seems to be like a very um, large expenditure on the city side of things, or uh, parking revenue and loss and expenditures on the uh, police side of things. Um, and also in the past, we've always tried to push these major events toward the outskirts of the seasons. So having another event within the season, you might get some pushback from individuals within the city. I like events. They bring they draw a lot of people down in the village. They shop, just like you just said. Um, but I think in the past, we've really tried to push these larger events toward the fringes to draw people in. We already have the people in the village right now. And in August, that's still in peak season. So I'm for this event, but I would recommend that we review it and maybe consider it toward either early spring, late fall, um, if there's any areas or where we can kind of shoehorn things in, in in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi. So I do one or two events in the village, and I have been working with OJ from the beginning. Actually, I was the first contact. Um, I've learned a lot about a lot of things in the past year, and yes, the timing isn't the best. We know that. Um, and I think if we do revisit this, we do need to move it to May, October, somewhere in another time frame. But I think they've worked very hard on this, and I think we can learn something for the Foundation Car Show, which I'm on, from them. Their marketing, some of their other things that they have, which maybe we could work jointly to improve our event. So in my eyes, I think it's a good start. Is it the wrong time of the year? Absolutely. I don't disagree with that. But I think we need to give it a shot and see what happens. And then knowing next year, we will try to work it at a better time frame. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to say I took a look at their application and I want to thank them and I appreciate them for not allowing any, no merchandise, no food and no alcohol. So they thought about the businesses when they planned for this event. I think that I appreciate them considering the local businesses for their event and not bringing in outside vendors to, uh, to compete, but allowing us the opportunity to benefit from their event. Thank you. Any further comments? Seeing none, we will bring it back to council. I have some remarks, but I will bring it to my colleagues first. Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah. Thank you to our public for the comments. Um, I just want to clarify, I said what was doable in the city, not all events, because they, they don't all always work. So I just want to provide clarity on that. Um, to our uh, applicants, have you considered a different date um, of our time of year? All right, I, I would share with my colleagues that August is busy. We still have guards out and just a really busy time of year. So if you would be open to that, what would work? Um, yes, we would be open to possibly change it to a different time of year. Um, October will not work for us because we have the wharf show in Santa Cruz. Um, everyone knows September, October is the perfect weather over here. So that's why we picked October for Santa Cruz. And when we applied for this, we were trying to coordinate with other Volkswagen events in California. There's a lot of them throughout the year. So this worked out pretty good. This date worked out for all their car shows. But yes, we would be willing to consider a possible uh, different date. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to, our fellow council members, just for discussion's sake, if you would be willing to um, have the applicants go back and talk with uh, our police department, with uh, Captain Ryan, on potential other dates and what would work with all the other stuff going on. If there's a, some wiggle room, summer's really hard for all the other events and camps and guards going on. I would, just be, I would see if council would be willing to. Yeah, I, I'm grateful for the application and I too am definitely pro events um, by all means. I do feel 
like slightly rushed on this this time frame and and just being the time of year that it is uh, I feel like we're kind of running into a sort of a cramped position and um, I would like maybe our, our PD to have a little bit more time to oh, yeah want up um, also yeah I, I don't know what your volunteer outreach has been locally but what that looks like and what is potential um, to have our involvement and kind of get more understanding, but he's. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Part of the reason, and I understand that it that it uh, feels rushed. The conversation happened months ago, but part of the reason that it landed on this date just to save back and forth is that this is the date that's available. In general, um, August is surprisingly a, a one of the less event heavy months um and september october very full september lots going on so that's how we landed here so unless it was going to be pushed the next year or after october mm -hmm. i mean i would be interested in me i mean november is still pretty awesome here um i i would feel bad trying to ask to push it back towards spring like that seems like a long way ways away but um i don't know what your thoughts are yeah it, it does feel a little rushed um i don't know if we can maybe do it on a trial basis for this this time and then see how it goes but what i like to also see happen is maybe we can remedy the uh issue of the revenue that we're going to miss from the parking especially in august when it's it's jumping down at the beach already there's a lot of people so that, that would be one thing I'd like to see staff maybe work on. Yeah, I mean, I can, I, I personally think it's, um, it's a lot for, for a quick August turnaround. I, if you would be, if the applicant would be willing to negotiate a next year timeline and really just go back to see what that looks like, I'm in favor of the event. I think it's great, and I appreciate it, um, you dedicating the funds to some amazing nonprofits. I just think that August is busy. We saw the other months when you were negotiating with our captain here. Um, but if next year springtime could be an option for you, we'd love, I'd personally love to have you come back. So if, um, I don't know that we need that in a motion, I'm looking, um, but I, we would need general consensus from council if you would be open to that. So I, I think um, I agree with the concerns that were shared about um, just how many events happen during the summer months in general. Um, and I know that we've heard in the past from village residents about kind of event fatigue. Um, even when we, um, even when we considered all of the events that we were gonna have for the year in January, we have um, residents coming in that are talking about that kind of event fatigue. So I do have a little bit of concern about that. Um, there was a question about net loss to the city. I'm not sure if any of our events that we grant major special event permits for are, are net positive for the city. I don't, uh, Captain Ryan, where's Captain Ryan? Um, do you have that, do you have that information or do you happen to know? So we, parking revenue, like I said previously, we have not charged. We don't charge the chamber. We don't charge the foundation when the village is shut down. We do recoup the cost if our staff from the from the public from public works we they'll they'll send their invoices through us, and as well as uh, PD staff. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so those are my concerns. I appreciate uh, the suggestion about considering a different date, and I appreciate that the event organizers are willing to consider a different date. I also think this would be a really fun event. I am just concerned about the quick turnaround and the date of the event itself. Um, those are my thoughts. Any additional comments? Do we have consensus or? I think we're all interested and excited to do something like this and collaborate but i think it does sound like we're all looking for possibly a different date correct 
So I think um, I can look for my to my fellow council members. It sounds like what we're asking is that PD work with the event organizers to explore different date options for this event. Is that correct? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. We are going to move on to item 9D, and that's the Cliff Drive Resiliency Project. No, we don't need a motion for that, correct? Okay. Correct. <laughs> All right. All right, good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, as you may recall, uh, this year we've been diligently working on uh, stabilizing Cliff Drive here, uh, coming into the village. We've been working with the past six months with uh, CSW, the uh, project uh, manager, or um, Robert Stevens is on the line for any uh, technical questions you may have at the end of the presentation, but I'm going to go ahead and start us off with what we've been working on the past six months. So we're going to go over the background, some of the existing conditions that we've been researching and studying. A summary of some of our outreach we've done so far. We're just at the beginnings of the public outreach for this project. Uh, options that are under consideration and kind of uh, the schedule and next steps of where this project is heading. Uh, so a little bit of the background, as you may recall, we had, uh, next slide please, uh, the storms in uh, January 2023 that caused some significant erosion around the parking lots, both on the upper and lower end of Cliff Drive. Uh, this gave us the upper, oops, last slide still. Uh, this gave us the opportunity to apply for funding with the uh, FHWA to do these repairs. As part of that application, you're also allowed to apply for what's called a betterment, so to make it more stable than it is currently. So that is what we did, and that was what was approved by FHWA. So not only are we doing repairs to what has been eroded, but we are also um, looking into doing a full shoreline protection project on the stretch of road. Next slide. So we've been approved so far by the FHWA to move forward with the design on to get the PSNA plan specifications and estimates along with all the permitting for this project. So that's what we have started on. That's about $700,000 from FHWA. Additionally, uh, Public Works and Planning applied for a Coastal Commission grant of $450,000 that was awarded that is also going towards this effort. Uh, construction funding thus far has been approved at $8 million from FHWA. It requires a match of approximately a million dollars. There's an order of magnitude error in the staff report, apologies. So a little over $900,000 of a required match, which we're seeking funding from, from state governments and other places uh, where you can get money for this kind of thing. Um, in October of 2023, you all approved a professional service agreement with CSW who has successfully uh, completed some of these projects up and down the coast. And we are currently in phase one of that contract, which is um, identifying a preferred alternative for the project. So that includes going over and examining our existing conditions and constraints of the project area, doing community and stakeholder outreach, stakeholders being uh, places like the Surfrider Foundation, other state agencies, and in our case also the county who owns some of the utilities and the roadway, and then identifying our project alternatives as required uh, by CEQA. So for FHWA's concerns is really the roadway. So they fund um, roadway projects. So this is the project area. You can see that the stairs technically are not in the project area. The FHWA does not consider that part of the road, but it is definitely part of what the mitigations will be for this project from other agencies to get the permits to fix the road. Next slide. So we did an extensive um, analysis of our existing conditions. Next slide. Um, as you may all be aware, it is a two-lane arterial road. There's really limited improvements for bikes and pedestrians on this road. However, that does not stop the bike and pedestrian traffic on this road. It is used a lot by locals and also visitors who park up this way and then walk down into the village. Next slide. Um, there is quite a bit of traffic on this road, obviously egress and in egress and ingress through the village. Um, about two thirds of that traffic go, goes up this area of Cliff Drive and then the rest of it up Wharf Road. Next slide. 
Um, it is also uh, identified as an emergency uh, evacuation route as part of our outreach. I have been speaking with our police department and also the fire district on the importance of this route as an arterial road for safety in the city. Next slide. Um, so our existing conditions, we've got a lot of cool pictures I'll be able to share with you later, um, but is showing the erosion over time in this area, and it's been relatively significant. Next slide. So we did also a pretty big deep dive of some of the history of the slope. We have some fun pictures from uh, 1905. We found in our council records from the 1960s of when the riprap was approved by council, though we were not able to find any plan sets for it. They had quite a long discussion on who should pay for it. Um, and then more recently in 1997, a soil nail wall was installed and that is what's currently there today. And it's at about the end of its useful life. Slide. Um, so our existing conditions, that wall obviously is still there. It is eroding on the bottom from wave action and just being exposed to the elements. And then also the riprap on the bottom, which has shifted over time and is allowed for uh, sea caves to erode underneath. So you can see some of that erosion here with the drone footage we were able to get. In some areas, it's pretty significant, um, particularly near where those parking areas are. Next slide. Um, so we've calculated the bluff erosion rate here to be about six inches per year, but that is obviously episodic. We've seen that over the beach um, down in New Brighton uh, most recently, but these things fall in chunks. So while it's six inches per year, a seismic event, a big wave event, makes this happen more rapidly any given year. Slide. Um, also, as part of this existing conditions, we're um, required to analyze some of the flora and fauna in the area and also the cultural resources, things you may dig up when you start a construction project. Uh, so far, we haven't run into anything really significant or not mitigatable that we anticipate would stop this project in any way. Next slide. Um, so this is a cut of the roadway. You can see the uh, SCC RTC right of way going all the way up to the roadway, including the uh, parking areas there on the landward side of the road. Um, our two lanes of traffic and our peds and bikes. Um, we have our tie back wall from 1996 and riprap. We are required to analyze whatever projects we do for sea level rise up to 100 years. Not that any kind of fix we put up there would last 100 years, but we are required, that is one of the benchmarks we're required to look at this project against. Next slide. So we have done some preliminary outreach for this project. Next slide. Um, in February, we had an outreach um, mostly of jewel box uh, neighborhoods, but there was representation from some of the businesses and other um, people in, in the city. Um, it was attended by about 20 people. Um, what was kind of surprising to me is how many people really do uh, walk down to the village on um, Cliff Drive. Like it is a significant portion of that traffic is walking traffic. Next slide. Um, and so we had a presentation and we also had breakout tables. There were two uh, groups that we were broken into and had different conversations with. Um, what came out of that was people really prefer the two-way traffic. There were definitely other opinions about one-way traffic and which way would be the preferable way. There were people who were like, we should have a closer traffic now and it should just be a walkway. So a lot of different opinions, but two-way traffic did come up as the uh, leader in the opinion of that particular outreach group. Next slide. And then overwhelmingly from the outreach group was that the, if affordable and feasible, the city should do something to address the erosion on this cliff side. Next slide. Um, so we have ongoing outreach. July is gonna be a busy month for us. We're gonna launch a survey and we're going to do some of that stakeholder outreach and uh, some other pop-ups um, with events going on in the city. Um, we have a dedicated webpage for this project and a dedicated email for this project that we have had said some good feedback from so far and are hoping to continue to get feedback as this project moves forward. Um, so now we get to their options of under consideration um, from some of the analysis that we've done so far. Next slide. Um, so to evaluate some of the options that we had, we really needed some project goals and for that goals a mission. So really the mission here is to improve mobility for all users, that's bikes, walkers, vehicles, to main, maintain access um, both to our village but also for coastal access into the future based on some of the uh, different things in weather um, that we've been seeing in the coming years. And to that we have project goals that kind of meet that mission um, to 
continue that access within the confines of those conditions and also reasonable cost and fe uh, engineering feasibility. Um, really critical to this project is improving our mobility. Um, there's two types of ways to do this, particularly for bikes and peds. Um, for their called class four and class one bikeways, they are grade separated, so there's something physically between the driver and the bicycle or pedestrian. Uh, class four being a bike lane on both sides and class one being a, what's considered a cycle track or a shared pathway, which is very similar to what is going on right now in East Cliff. Next slide. Um, so there really is three options. There's protect, try to keep the infrastructure we have. There's adapt, which is a kind of knowing that we're going to change and doing lesser to protect the shoreline. And then there's the retreat, which is kind of the do nothing option. So to get a little more into the details of those, starting with retreat, next slide, would be the do nothing. And so as I mentioned before, the 1997 wall is eroding from both the top and the bottom. Next slide. And really we expect it to continue to erode over time. Again, we expect that to probably be episodic and potentially catastrophic, not to be doomsday, but if we were to lose a big chunk of that roadway, obviously whoever's on the roadway at that time would be effective, but there's also critical infrastructure in that roadway. There's a sewer force main, there's water lines, there are things that would affect not just the roadway, but really many, many residents for a long time if we were to lose a significant chunk of this roadway in one go. And that could be sea level rise and erosion, that could be a seismic event. Um, but that is something that is definitely in our future. Uh, I cannot get the consultant to tell me when that would be. No one can lay, no one will put money to when, but is definitely something that will happen in the future. Next slide. Um, one of the potentials here is to adapt. And so that would be, rather than doing a full on shoreline protection device, would be to improve what we have. So to repair the wall in areas where it's eroded, to fill in the sea caves, and restack the riprap. And really, again, this will just buy us time. It will continue to erode. We will have to do something more significant. And so the next step to the adapt, next slide, would be to consider losing one of the lanes of traffic to, you would still have the road, but you would have to reduce the flow put. So that is also one of the options that we have to address and analyze through kind of our CEQA and Coastal Commission permitting process. And um, we did kind of float this idea with the uh, resident outreach that we did in February, and that would be making this a one-way street. Um, it makes the most sense for it to be egress from the village for emergency um, route purposes, having more ways out of the low lying areas out rather than in, and then making that circulation through the jewel box neighborhood, which would be really significant. Next slide. Um, there, obviously, we'd have to cross the rail line in some fashion, which would be very significant all in itself. And then the roadways, both 49th and 47th, really aren't suitable for um, arterial traffic. We do have really wide right-of-ways, so there definitely are improvements that could be made, but those would be significant costly undertakings. Next slide. Another option for the ADAPT is to not do the improvements to the uh, seaward facing side of the wall, but try to make improvements um, kind of into the street. So making a wall that goes like into the ground and letting the roadway erode away. And eventually the outside of the cliff would be where you built that wall. Um, that would be a little bit of a more proactive approach, um, a more expensive approach, definitely. And um, still gets you to that one way traffic. So you still would have to do improvements elsewhere in the city to continue circulation. Next slide. So our third option here is to protect. And so that also gives us the opportunity to do those really nice improvements to our coastal access. Um, so we would be able to um, keep both lanes of travel, develop some kind of class one pathway for bikes and peds for ingress and egress to the village and also to the coastline. Um, and that would, would include modifying our parking, but still allowing for parking. It would just have to be parallel parking to have significant right of way and also give a chance for overlooks for some kind of visitor serving use, which is very um, attractive when you're trying to get something like this permitted. Next slide, please. Uh, there's different ways to pro do a protection type project. Um, one of them would be a full facing wall. Um, we are analyzing several different options for this. Uh, they all have different costs. 
Um, so that is one option. It would involve cantilevering some of the, uh, or making the roadway go out over the ocean a bit to get all the right of way you would need to do that pathway, which is significantly expensive. But like I said, to get something permitted like this would probably be necessary. Next slide. There's also the option similar to option two, where we do the uh, internal wall closer to the, uh, to the seaward end, which would require a much longer cantilever out into the ocean for the walkway. And like I said, we are currently analyzing kind of the different costs and feasibilities between those options. Next slide. Um, additional design considerations that the FHAWA doesn't care about that, but we very much care about are uh, vertical access. Um, so the stairway, as you know, is currently blown out, has been blown out twice in the past uh, two years. So really making that a more permanent structure, either concrete or something that's built into some whatever shoreline protective device that we have, like those two pictures up at the top there. And then also considerations for surfer safety, having somewhere for them to have a refuge while we're waiting for rescue efforts is something that's been incorporated into a lot of these shoreline armoring devices in the past couple decades. So this was included in your agenda packet. This is really a qualitative kind of comparison of options summary, and then uh, based on some of those goals that we had earlier. So just briefly to go over this, kind of our service life, which is pretty important in here, with our do nothing option is really a time bomb, an alarm clock, something marginal and negligible that we don't know when something is going to happen, but we do know it well. Option two definitely buys us more time, but still will require us to do a significant project in the future. Option three is what we would consider a more permanent project, kind of a one and done, at least for our lifetime. Um, for the cost, capital cost here is really our initial cost. So our initial cost in the next five years to do nothing costs us nothing. Um, to adapt costs us less than to protect, um, but you have to really consider the life cycle cost of the do nothing if we have that catastrophic event or we decide to lose one lane of traffic and are adapt and we have to do improvements to other places where the life cycle of keeping our circulation in place is really lesser if you go um, with a full protection option. And then we also consider coastal access and traffic impacts, which I think are pretty self-explanatory for the option one where you lose the roadway, that you lose access, you have significant traffic impacts. Going down to one lane also has traffic impacts, but does have the potential to improve coastal access since you'll have more right away to put a walkway where the street used to be. Um, and then uh, the option three protect has a really good chance of enhancing coastal access with the walkway and vertical access and then really having no change to our current um, traffic circulation. Next slide. Next steps. So while that is qualitative, we are working on the quantitative piece of this. We're gonna complete our analysis of options and continue our stakeholder outreach. I anticipate being back here in the fall to talk money with you all uh, in more detail. And then our future task within the next year is to really go out and get all of this permitted, get our LCP amendment with the Coastal Commission, have our final ps &E, uh, do all of our um, environmental permitting and um, other permitting that we'd have to do th with this project, and have our final design and have it shovel ready to request funds from the FHWA by September 2025. Um, that is when we would request funds, depending on what the state of the federal government is at that time, it may come with three months, it may come in 18 months, but we have to request it by September 2025. Next slide. Um, so the, I'm just going to leave this up just for you to reference, but that is the end of my presentation. Like I said, uh, Robert Stevens with CSW, who's our consultant on this project, is on the line if you have really detailed questions. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Um, so we're going to do council questions at this time. I just want to start with... Um, Coastal Commission. It seems like that's kind of the big elephant in the room is, are they going to even allow us to do some kind of protection measures? I know that they're kind of leaning towards managed retreat right now. So part of the funding to design this project is from the Coastal Commission. So they're very aware of the project, obviously. They've given us funding to go do it. We are going through the process. We actually had a meeting with them. I want to say this week, mm -hmm. um, Robert, if you're on the line, if you would, he works with the Coastal Commission regularly, has put several of these projects all the way through completion. So, Robert, if you had anything to add on that. I so they've seen the armoring option? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, I think it was a very productive meeting with the Coastal Commission. I think they were very encouraging. I think they recognize the importance of coastal access, both at the top of bluff, as well as to get down uh, to the ocean. So I think that there's a path forward. Good, good, I'm glad to hear that, thank you. Further questions? Um, so I, I understand that the city of Santa Cruz is, kind of, is also looking at this. Are we looking at some sort of joint efforts or joint funding efforts or trying to align kind of the visions together so we don't look disjointed. <laughs> so I can't fully speak for the city of Santa Cruz process. I will say the funding that they're getting is different. They are getting funding to do emergency repairs up front. So they are already under contract. They're doing that work right now. And I know they're also doing some kind of long-term visioning plan. The funding that we're getting from the FHWA is for what they're called permanent project. And so this requires this doing this whole process of permitting and the whole rigmarole. Um, so Santa Cruz for their project went and appropriately went for the quicker funding option. So it's they're different, different programs. Thank you. Questions? If, if we go with option three and, and do the protection, how many parking spaces are we going to lose from the diagonal to the parallel parking? That's a great question. Several. I don't know if, uh, Robert, you have a more detailed number there off the yes, top of my head. Yeah, so I would say there's about three to four, but it's not been completely kind of refined yet. And it also has to do, too, with how uh, the, the, the the class one pathway that the Santa Cruz County Transportation uh, Commission is working on, that also adjusts some of the parallel parking uh, in that location. I think that's a really great question. I think it's something we need to look towards. And, and also with that, uh, if you look at Cliff Drive, our parking ends well before 47th Avenue. If you continued the parallel parking, I, I counted the other day, it would be a little over 20 spots. We would we can gain back if we went all the way to 47th Avenue with parallel parking. Just a thought. Thank you. Questions? Any further questions? No? Okay. Uh, with that, we will take we will take this out to public comment. Is there any member of the public that would like to comment on this item? Seeing none, we will back, uh, come back to council for discussion uh, to provide feedback on the preferred design alternatives. Any comments? Yeah, comment. This is definitely an important project. Uh, you know, they're dealing with it over there on the, on the west side of Santa Cruz, and now we're dealing with it here with us. We need to you know, protect it the best we can, and the option three seems by far the best, in my opinion. Yeah, I'll second that. Um, thank you for all the hard work, as always. Um, I guess I guess I do have a question. Sorry, I don't know why this didn't come to me earlier. Um, when you're talking about how the, like essentially the street would extend past the cliff to create just like more pedestrian use or, but then what's, what's the feasibility that that's gonna, stay maintained like I, I don't know that just seems more dangerous to me for some reason i don't know like what it is is significantly more expensive okay okay <laughs> like yes it is very feasible yes it is very expensive so within that option three would that part of it be mandatory to do like would we have to extend or we maybe don't know yet if it's likely Okay. Likely that providing a pedestrian, a safe pedestrian walkway would be a condition of having this project permitted. Right. Okay. And most likely something that does have like the, the barrier, the, that you should. That's grade class, separated. Yes. The grade separated. Thank you. Um, okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Jessica, how long would we expect if we were to do the armoring? How long would we expect that to last? You mentioned within our lifetime. So is this a 30, 50 year that's hard to say. <laughs> hundred years? I would say usually you aim for these to be about 50-year projects. All right. Um, any further feedback before I give mine? Yeah, I, I just appreciate that we are, we're moving forward with, with um, a project. We know we've had several natural disasters occur. We see the impact. We know that we need to do something. And so um, I just... I'm a little envious of our staff here uh, moving forward rather than just looking at short-term 
um, answers to, to solve this problem. Um, I think for option three for protection makes the most sense. Um, should we get the funding and then try to do our best? Um, in terms of like community input and all that sort of stuff, I don't really know like what the best plan for that, especially when we know the answer is to save, <laughs> protect, and we need, we need to actually do um, that. But the other piece that I'm missing and we'll get there is just how the traffic will flow. So once we see maybe some lane mergers and more pedestrian bike, um, how are we going to deal with just a traffic impact and we can't go down or cut between the streets? And so maybe now is a time that we can start really planning or practicing such measures um, in dealing with traffic flow and just testing things out, obviously not during summer, um, but um, at a different time. I think we just have an opportunity to really um, practice different methods and different approaches um, before having to make final decisions. And then we can use that as information here when we finally have to make those long-term um, decisions. So um, thank you. So uh, the agenda suggests that we are giving uh, feedback. Do you need an actual motion on which? OK, so do you have the feedback from the council? Yes. OK, great. Thank you so much. We'll move on now to item 9E, Memorandum of Understanding with Mid-Management Employee Group and Management and City Manager Compensation Plans. Hi. Thank you, Mayor. Hi. I do actually have a slide with the recommended action. Um, clerk. Hi, Mayor Brown and Council. Thank you. This is going to be an oral report. Um, California Government Code Section 50, uh, 54953, C3 requires a oral summary before council takes action on the executive compensation. So I'm going to do that summary for you now. Item 9E, this item, does recommend, as you see on the screen here, your approval of a resolution, resolution regarding the compensation and benefits plan between the city and the department head group and the city manager. This item does also include a recommendation to approve an MOU with the mid-management employees. So the department head plan and city manager contract provide for the following economic benefits. A 3% cost of living increase in years one, two, and three between $1,000 and $2,250 in city healthcare contributions, depending on the level of coverage, and the establishment of a 5% specialty pay for approved bilingual speakers. The same economic benefits with the addition of deferred compensation have been approved and are recommended for your approval this evening for other city employees. Additional economic benefits that could be possible within year one are one-time equity adjustments in the amounts of 8.75%, 3.61%, and 4.3% dependent on the position, a longevity pay schedule, which includes a 5% increase at year 10, 3% at 15, and 2% at year 20, and additional compensation for certifications like post and civil engineering, and um, additional healthcare contributions are possible in year two and three. Those um, possible equity adjustments, the same longevity schedule I just outlined, and the additional healthcare in year two and three are included in the proposed mid-management MOU and have already been approved or will be approved by proposed to council, excuse me, not telling you what to do, uh, for other represented employee groups. That's my summary, and the official recommended action is on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from council? No questions? Question? No? Okay. We will, thank you, Chloe. We'll go to public comment. Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, we will bring it back to council for discussion and a vote. We will entertain a motion. I am fine to move the recommended action, which is to authorize the city manager to execute a successor agreement to the existing MOU with negotiated changes for the mid-management employee group subject to technical changes and to execute a successor agreement to the existing management compensation plan. We have a motion. Do we have a second? And? Oh, there was an additional... Additional. There, there's no number three there. Okay. <laughs> number three that's not listed is to authorize the mayor to execute the eight amendment to the city manager employment agreement. That's you. All right. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll move on to item 
9F, Fiscal Year 24-25 Budget and Capital Improvement Program. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Welcome. So this last item before you is consideration of the proposed budget for Fiscal Year 24-25. Um, just to remind you of the process, the proposed budget was distributed on May 3rd. The Finance Advisory Committee held special meetings to discuss the regular meeting on May 14th and 21st. Met on May 14th and 30th, with on May 30th giving a direct report to Captain Nexo on adoption. Slide, please. Um, so, <clears throat> the proposed budget and the packet tonight has an updated ending fund balance as we just concluded or have almost concluded negotiations. I think we have one left. Um, so, the proposed and planned budget are both balanced. Um, we're maintaining an estimated fund balance of about 642000 with 500 of that as our additional target um, balance, 100 for employee down payment assistance, and 42,000 that's just uh, kind of undesignated at this point. Um, we're also utilizing $239,000 of general fund resources for city council goals, and those are listed. The first three there are, part, are you know, the employee down payment assistance program that I mentioned above, and then the first three are kind of um, more along projects in the public works space that will pop up again later. the other ones that came out of the city council goals as far as um, translations and election outreach and things like that as they just came out. Um, as far as our CIP program, we have 10 projects at about $16.6 .6 million carrying over from prior years. We also um, are recommending one project this year funded from special revenue for uh, pavement management. And then we have three council goals, the three that I just mentioned, um, for $100,000. This does not include that we still have two storm damage uh, repairs that we're working through with FEMA right now. We're estimating at about $400,000. Um, as far as mid-year, uh, we talked about a ballot measure earlier this morning, or this morning, this evening. Um, it's been a long day. It feels like it was this morning. It feels like tomorrow already. <laughs> um, so if that ballot, depending on the outcome of that ballot measure, we may be back amending our sales tax revenue at mid-year, we'll also be watching all of the other um, revenues, building permits, parking, um, and the TOT. Um, also on the expenditure side, the ballot measure, there's inside of the um, labor contracts, there's contingent pieces. So if the ballot measure passes, that would trigger some major budget amendments tied to that ballot measure as well. And it would kind of stack it that way. Slide, um, so as far as a summary, again, the fiscal year 24-25 and 25-26 budgets are structurally balanced. Balanced, However, we are using Measure F funding to cover operations at this point. And then you'll see once that Measure F expires in December of 2027 that our projections show the general fund going imbalanced. Um, however, our reserves are remaining at target levels at this point right now. Um, general fund revenue, sales tax, and TOT, we had kind of a a dip from the pandemic and then we had some pretty good growth that's starting to level off more traditional type growth that we saw pre-pandemic so we're watching that closely as well as like I said the other um, revenue sources that we have uh, the proposed budget maintains the high service levels that we've had but again with measure F, with measure F expiring that becomes more challenging in the future and then just as a reminder we have our community grant program being partially funded with CDBG grant funds right now that expires this year and this is also the end of our community grant three-year cycle so we'll be bringing that back in the fall to talk about the next cycle as well as applying for more um, CDBG grant funding next slide please so the recommended action this evening is to approve the resolution adopting the fiscal year 24-25 operating budget and capital improvement program and adopting the resolution approve the resolution adopting the associated salary schedule and new job descriptions and with that I'm happy to answer any questions thank you council questions then council questions okay we'll take this out to public comment any public comment on this item seeing none we'll bring it back to council for further deliver deliberation or entertaining a motion <laughs> can I 
move the recommended action. Approve the resolution adopting fiscal year 24-25 operating budget and capital improvement program. And to approve the resolution adopting the associated salary schedule and new job descriptions. I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. All right, team, way to be efficient. Uh, we are now at item 10, which is adjournment. We will adjourn to our next regularly scheduled city council meeting on July 25th. Enjoy your month off of council, and we'll see you next month. Until then, please take care of yourselves and take care of each other. We're adjourned. <laughs>